Yeah, no, prepping for research is much like prepping for a conference. <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes sense. You never know where you're going to go. Yeah. So it looks like folks are pretty much settled in, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. Um, if you are here about content strategy and content migration strategy, you are in the right place, so welcome. Um, my name is Danny Solomon, and just to level set, because sometimes this can mean different things for different folks, um, what I'll be talking about today with content migration is kind of everything leading up to moving content into the new CMS. So not actually any of the kind of like automating around that or actually input into the CMS, but like all of the prep work, thinking and planning and strategy that kind of gets us to that point. Um, so before I jump in, I'm just out of curiosity, how many of you guys are maybe currently involved in a project where there might be some moving of content or looking at that perhaps in the near future? Cool. Okay, great. And how many of you are feeling, I don't know, maybe concerned, worried, have questions, uh, maybe some existential dread, anything around that with having to do with your content? Cool. <laughs> well, not cool, but hopefully <laughs> out of today, um, that my hope is that you can walk away with at least some ideas of how to either approach some content strategy yourself in the context of this um, maybe website redesign or website re relaunch or also some expectations if you invite somebody else who does do content strategy onto your project, what they might be doing um, when the ideal time is for them to do it. Um, and also some idea of why waiting until the last minute to do anything around content with this um, website relaunch or redesign can end up actually costing more money and more time. So I'll start by this kind of overused metaphor of content migration um, that is actually kind of useful. And um, a lot of folks like to describe a kind of content migration as moving into a new house. If you are buying a new house perhaps and um, perhaps the, moving, the house that you're moving into has a different room set up, um, different, a different number of rooms, different paint job, whatever. Um, and the content being all of your stuff, all of your furniture that you're moving into your new house. Um, and like moving and like packing, a lot of folks that I see run into this, uh, this challenge of constantly underestimating how long it takes to pack. Um, where as you kind of go to start uh, sorting through all of the stuff on your site or all the stuff in your house, um, you might realize like, hey, oh, I, I have all this stuff that I didn't know I had before. Or like, what are all these treasures? What are, or what is all this trash that's just sitting in the corner that I haven't dealt with for five years? Um, a lot of that happens on content migration projects. Now the other thing about that is often when you are moving or redesigning or replatforming your site, the kind of structure that you're moving into is a lot different than what your existing site is today. Um, so when you're thinking about that new space, um, there's also a lot of planning and thinking about how uh, you fit your stuff into that space. Maybe it's a totally different style. Uh, maybe your house is on Mount Vernon on the Potomac River and all of a sudden you need like pool floaties and where are all, all these pool floaties going to go? Or there's, there's maybe an empty house next to the kitchen where all the pool floaties are going to go, but then people are going to have to walk through the kitchen to get to the pool floaties. And does that really make sense? So these are kind of necessary conversations to have about your stuff, about where it's going to fit into your new house, and maybe even if the stuff is even relevant to your new place. But more often than not, companies are underestimating both the time that it takes uh, to have these conversations and the ripple effect that these conversations will have on both the design and platforming decisions of your site. So much so that content is actually one of the top reasons that delay a website relaunch. So what do I know? Um, I've been a content strategist at EPAM for about four years. Um, I've led multiple content migration, uh, migrations at EPAM, including one of the largest ones that we've done, um, and worked, I've worked across a number of different kind of verticals and industries um, with a lot of different tech-minded folks. So I've seen, I've seen this happen quite a few times, and I've also been there when we prevented it from happening, happening which is what I'm going to share kind of both perspectives on with you today. 
also really quickly to just level set, because content strategy itself can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and like a true content strategist, I'm leading with a definition. Uh, so content strategy guides the creation, curation, usage, and governance of content based on stated goals and objectives. So these can be business objectives as well as user objectives. So put in another way, um, this is a, a diagram that one of my colleagues, Nicole Hess at EPEM, put together based on Christina Halverson's content strategy cube. Um, and the idea of this being that content strategy kind of builds on itself with, at its core, uh, content strategy being focused very much on structure. So the way that content is organized and maybe tagged for users for both uh, internal users of that content and makers of those content, uh, but also for customers. And then building on top of that, we have process. So the processes behind building that content so um, figuring out roles and responsibilities, who's accountable for creating that content at any one time, um, making sure that that content is going through a clear life cycle through ideation, creation, and archival of that content. And then layered on top of that, we have the experience of that content. So what is the strategy to ensure that that content is uh, enabled for things like personalization or localization or the experience of somebody moving through your site? And then on top of that, we have editorial. So the kind of more day-to-day -day planning and managing of that creation of content, making sure that it's adhering to a, a specific voice and tone that is constant throughout the site. And notice we don't even have on there anything about copy creation. All of this uh, is part of content strategy that would then kind of have like another layer on top that is your actual copy creation. So content strategy is really getting us ready to put that final layer of words on your site. So why should you care about content strategy? And we are getting to the actual examples, I promise. Um, in my kind of biased opinion, people come to sites for its content. That yes, you absolutely have to have a fully functional site, a beautifully designed site, but if you don't have the content that people need to solve their problem, then you might as well not have a site at all. Content strategy, i found, also tends to make things a little bit more real, um, specifically when we're talking about kind of wireframes and comps, that often I see um, folks using kind of defaulting to a lorem ipsum type style in their, uh, in their comps and wireframes as filler because we're not really sure what content should be going there. Sometimes this is fine. Um, but I've seen in many cases where we have challenged our internal teams to not use lorem ipsum, um, and in so doing, actually iterated on the design of the page itself and iterated on the functional requirements of the page itself because we actually got real about what needed to be on that page. Um, content strategy also supports the site's longevity. Um, EPAM is an end-to-end -end agency, so a lot of my agent, or a lot of my experience is from the agency's perspective. So I'll be speaking to that. Um, but oftentimes, you know, we're engaged in a very long project, maybe a year-long project, to get this, uh, you know, new site up and running and like filled with um, the right content, the right designs, uh, fueled by those business requirements. Um, but content strategy and training those those content folks on the client side um, and informing them of what the design de decisions were that. Um, will provide them with options for what components to use on a page, will actually make sure that this beautiful site that we spent so much time and money putting together um, actually stays that way for a little bit longer. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I'll forget if we get to the end on this. Um, when you say to use real content, I work for the government. And yeah. If we use real content, then it becomes FOIAable. It becomes what, sorry? Uh, someone can put in a request for FOIA for draft content. So if we use real mm -hmm. content that might or might not get changed, mm -hmm. it becomes more of a, a, a risk for additional records requirements. So do you recommend that to government clients too or non-government mostly? Um. I'll be honest, I'm not totally understanding what the context is of, the, of your question. Are you saying 
that when senior management usually does not like you to use real content because it makes it available to anyone for records management. I see. Meaning press can request it through FOIA. Um, the Information Act. Gotcha. Okay. I I would definitely love to talk more about that so I can understand a little bit more before just leaping to it to answer because I'm not totally sure I understand um, what this context is, but I want to definitely talk more about this after. Um, um, and not having content strategy could also lose your company money. Um, in this first example that we are going to talk about, um, content strategy was not involved uh, throughout most of the project. And then the client realized at the end that, oh shoot, we have all this, this beautifully new redesigned site and none of our content fits anymore. Um, and so they had to pay us uh, a bunch more money to kind of come in and like change things uh, to make sure that the content would uh, kind of fit appropriately. In other words, failure to include content strategy has some real consequences. So, Today we'll cover, in the next 40-ish minutes or so, um, two different uh, content migrations. The first one uh, is about a regional utility site where content strategy, as I mentioned, came in very late. Um, I'll talk through kind of what our approach was, what we did, um, and some lessons learned. And then our second case uh, study is a global roofing company where content strategy came in a little bit less late. Um, again, I'll talk about the approach and what we did, and also how uh, those lessons that we previously learned were applied to that project. And then I'll end with um, some, some pointers for, to look out for in case you might need a content strategist on your project. So this, uh, this company was a power company that generated electricity and gas. It was uh, very much like a PICO here, um, and it generated that those utilities for 4 million customers. Um, their kind of overarching goal was to improve customer satisfaction. They had a very old, outdated site, and they were looking to uh, not only give it a facelift, but also um, put it on some more robust software. Um, so they well, we EPAM helped them redesign this current site and they worked with another third party to re-platform it onto Sitecore. And kind of at a glance, um, this is a, you know, a very kind of typical uh, project process uh, where we start with a discovery to figure out what maybe some of the kind of business requirements are for the site, what they're doing well, what they're not doing so well, um, to a design uh, phase, which is a kind of uh, taking that and taking what their vision is for the new site and making it into um, a kind of roadmap with wireframes and comps and things like that uh, for the new site. And then the last phase being building uh, that, actually building that site um, and creating uh, leave behinds to support the longevity of that site. Um, so you'll notice that there's no content strategy. There was no content strategy in the discovery, nor was there any in the design. And then as right before they were going to start to build this site, they realized that they needed um, help to get their content ready. Um, so we came on right before the developers kind of hopped on to help them get um, about 500 pages of content ready for this new site. So we basically had kind of a project within a project um, where our discovery, and I'll go more in detail to each of these chunks in a bit, involved um, these kinds of deliverables, um, starting with an inventory and audit to see what they had on the site, um, and followed by content mapping, governance, web, uh, writing for the web, content migration, creation, uh, and then some leave behinds. So I'll go into each of those chunks. Uh, the first one being that we had our own kind of content strategy discovery at the tail end of this project. Um, and the point of a content strategy discovery is to start to identify and prioritize content requirements for the new site. 
Um, so with that, this, uh, we started with a content inventory. So the questions that are, you typically are trying to answer with a content inventory are things like what content exists on the site today? Um, as well as, in our case, what kind of SEO and accessibility exists today? In other words, what, what are we doing well today that we definitely want to keep going onto the new site? And what are some of the gaps that maybe we can improve upon in this opportunity of having a new platform to jump onto? Um, so then we audited this inventory um, to figure out whether how much uh, the site was adhering to best practices today and prioritize those for what needs to be fixed before launch. Um, in other words, what content strategy activities definitely need to happen before uh, this site goes live, and then also what can wait until after. And one of the key outputs of that content inventory is a list of all of the URLs that are currently on the site. Um, and because we came in late, we had uh, an information architecture from the, our uh, user experience counterparts where we were then able to quickly kind of see like, okay, this is, this is your new site, this is you, your new IA, how the, or the content will be organized on the new site, and this is all your existing stuff. And so the content map was literally mapping all of those URLs to that new IA and identifying exactly where those gaps were. So in doing so, we found about 28,000 assets on their uh, existing site, which was a lot more than they thought they had. Uh, six key opportunity areas to focus on for that content audit, um, mostly around kind of some SEO stuff, as well as some um, accessibility. Uh, and then we mapped about 800, almost 800 URLs to that new IA. Which sounds great, and it was. But uh, we were affected by the fact that CS came in late to this process. So plus side being we had this research-driven foundation um, for this information architecture. We had a map to follow um, and a clear measure for where our gaps were so we could start to estimate how much time it would take to fill those gaps. However, um, because we were not involved up front, and because there was also not clear expectation management with the client, um, there were a lot of new content discoveries along the way that actually changed the IA, um, so that we had to iterate on this information architecture, I think like six or seven times throughout this five month pro process. Um, and this is not a, in itself a, a bad thing, this is a totally normal thing to happen. Um, but on the kind of stage that you are on in front of a client in an agency setting and not setting that expectation early on that this was a part of the process because a lot of our, a lot of our team didn't even know that this was going to happen, um, this, was, this definitely put us against the clock and put us in a position where we had a little bit of explaining to do. So next time, um, a big realization that came out of this was that uh, Content changes design, and design changes content. Um, that together they are make up this kind of iterative evolution of any site, and that there should be time allowed for that in this kind of process, if possible. And one possible solution to that is getting content strategy involved earlier into a project. Uh, so the next phase of of our kind of mini project was a content strategy design of sorts. Um, so this involves setting up the teams, the processes, and the tools um, for this content migration so that we were equipped on our side and equipped on the client side to create this content in the amount of time that we had. So for us that included a governance assessment and plan, a content migration plan, and writing for the web workshops. So governance, assessment, and plan. Um, this was really to try to answer the question of what content processes, roles, and responsibilities exist on the client side today. So who, um, who, is, who is adding content to the site? Um, who is getting blocked from adding content to the site when they need to be adding content to the site? What are the kind of pain points that they might be experiencing with the system, with the CMS, um, even with their fellow team members to try to get um, their message on the site. 
And then the content migration plan being, okay, well, literally what do we need to do in the next five months and how do we do it? Um, and what is our kind of timeline and milestones uh, for, for making sure that we are staying on track? Um, and then lastly, for this particular project, um, we were working with about 100 subject matter experts on the client side to validate the content that we would be creating. Um, and because they are subject matter experts in their fields, uh, writing for the web is not necessarily one of their kind of main job criteria. So in order to help educate them exactly what we were looking for on their side, um, we need to, to all get on the same page about what writing for the web really means and what are some best practices around that. So, again, this went great, but it could have been better. Um, this content migration was basically a dry run for this governance. So out of the governance portion of this, you know, we identified a workflow for them to follow for creating different content types, um, identified kind of roles and responsibilities, identified a task force who could be kind of relied upon to make sure that content on the site was adhering to those writing for the web best practices. And this content migration, this five month content migration was basically kind of experiment for that. So we kind of put these teams in place and put these processes in place and then we're able to kind of see like, hey, what's working in this and what's working, not working so that when they are kind of on their own doing this when the site is live, um, they have identified some of those pain points early on. However, um, having those subject matter experts come on super, super late in the process um, made getting that targeted feedback more difficult. Um, so instead of them having been informed from the beginning of like, hey, we're redoing the website and it's going to have a new design and it's going to be on a new platform, we were kind of explaining this as we were in the room with them trying to get their feedback on like the go solar section of the website, um, which costs us uh, more, more time and I think on their side a little bit more frustration in the long run. So for next time, uh, I would get more input from the subject matter experts earlier on. There's kind of a theme going that I'm just realizing is just get people involved early. And then a content strategy build. So this is the moment where we're making all the stuff. Uh, for this particular project, we had um, the on-page content creation, um, so the SEO-related content uh, creation, as well as image sourcing. Um, so in total, we made about 500 pieces of content for this new, this new website. Uh, a little over 600 uh, pieces of metadata, so things like page titles, meta descriptions, um, alt text for images, um, and we sourced well over 500 images, but nobody really wanted to count. We just knew it was more than that. Um, and as we were building, you know, building these pages, I think a lot of times the expectation is with companies is that, oh, you know, this page exists on this page. Why can't we just, like, Quick, plug it, plug it in into the new into the new site. Like it should, we should be, we should be able to automate that, right? Yeah. Um, well, a lot of the reason that uh, a new site is being created is because it doesn't fit the needs of the current site, and so uh, that new design with a new kind of module over here or a new kind of link uh, way to link to things over here will actually affect how that content should be structured within the page itself. And so even though we had about, I don't know, 60 to 70% of the content that like did exist in some form, all of it needed to be re rejiggered and redone for this new site. Not to mention that very little of it actually adhered to writing for the web best practices because their existing uh, governance structure had folks where content wasn't their specialty just putting content in the new site and there was nobody there to check that against uh, what those best practices were. So, in the end, we did set out, uh, we did like do what we needed to do. We got the site ready on time in our timeline that we had defined. Um, however, we 
we lost a bit of time in there for things that could have been prevented up front. Um, so one of those being, we used a lot of time sourcing images. Um, I think up front, when the, uh, when the kind of wireframe and design for these various pages um, were being approved, the stakeholders involved you know, kind of thought, knew in the back of the he their head that there is this repository for images that exists and people pull in it all the time and it's never been a problem. Um, but when you're actually in there pulling images yourself and seeing that there is, uh, seeing only what's available and when your new site is a lot more image heavy than your old site, um, we quickly ran out of images. And so this, uh, created the need to kind of look outside to, for another um, image sourcing, for other image sourcing options when at the beginning if we had just known that hey we actually have limited uh, images available we could have, we could have uh, affected the design in that way. Um, we also because of this uh, started to rush getting that subject matter input um, for, for page context. Uh, originally, we had thought that you know each you know a, a difficult page is going to take x amount of days, and an easy page is going to take you know this amount of days. Um, but as we were getting in there, looking at more of those difficult pages, um, we started running into things like, oh, we need to iterate actually in the whole information architecture of this area of the site, and I had to constantly kind of go back and forth and and figure that out as we were going, which again is part of the process. Um, but we were not in a position to set those expectations with the client earlier on. So just knowing that this was coming um, and knowing that this is coming in and following project is, is helpful. So next time. Uh, I, next time we would provide feedback earlier on uh, for design uh, to create less of an image-driven site, knowing that we didn't have many images to draw on in the first place. And we would also get subject matter expert input earlier on into the design phase. And lastly, uh, the content strategy support part of this project within a project. Um, so this often looks like creating you know, leave behinds for ongoing content creation. It can also look like training, um, training different folks who might be in content departments uh, or kind of content adjacent departments who might be subject matter experts, um, all in an effort to make sure that the new site uh, kind of stays as pretty and sparkly as when you uh, first deliver it. So for us, that looked like a best practices guide and a content module guide. Best practices guide being uh, just tips and tricks for writing uh, for the web. Uh, and a content module guide being um, a kind of guide to all of the components within, uh, a, within the wireframes. So often when we are creating uh, sites for large enterprise clients with a lot of different kind of templates and wireframes available to them to make pages, um, it can often be overwhelming. And so this module guide is literally a guide to all of the different kind of components available to a content creator uh, for when they need to maybe create a new page or change an existing page. So, um, starting late affected us in a bit of ways. Um, we kind of, in a great way, had this a componentized approach to design that was flexible. It supported more or less most of the needs that came up in our, um, as we were going to write the content, and we were able to create these leave-behinds to prolong the life of the site. However, development, which in this case was a third party, not EPAM, which is pretty abnormal for our company, uh, this party was not looped in until they started building. Um, so we had devised a kind of beautifully thought through, you know, componentized modular approach to uh, building pages, um, and then basically handed it over. So they uh, were kind of given, uh, thrown for a bit of a loop on that. 
And because we had such a large number of components and templates, it took longer to start to onboard some of these subject matter, uh, sorry, these content creators for the future version of their site. So next time, uh, we would get input from development uh, earlier on. Cool. So the next case study is around this roofing company. Uh, so this was a slightly different flavor of a content migration project that we did after this first one, where we actually got to apply some of these learnings and come in a little bit earlier in the project. So this, global, uh, this company was a global roof manufacturer and distributor. Um, they were present in about 38 different countries. Um, and their uh, kind of overall goal was a little bit different than the utility company in that they were, had acquired a bunch of different brands and were looking to kind of unify all of those under a single branded site while still giving each of the countries their own autonomy in their own kind of country sites. So um, we designed a new website experience based on Sitecore and Hybris um, and migrated, uh, migrated being editing, creating, all that stuff that we just talked about going into that, moved all of the content in some way or another from um, the existing sites, there were about like 160 of them, to their new sites, which uh, there will be about 40. It's still ongoing. Uh, so much like before, uh, we followed this process of discovery, design, build, and support. Um, however, there are a couple key differences, uh, one being that the developers were involved from start to finish. And content strategy was involved in design, which is a little bit better, but not quite there yet. So we also did a lot of this, a lot of similar activities, but with a slightly different bent. Starting, of course, with an inventory audit and map to see what they had and see how it fit and didn't fit into the new site. And then for our design, they were less interested in governance, but um, the way that the project was set up was that we would do kind of one country at a time. So in this case, we started with uh, Norway as kind of our dry run country site. Um, and each of those subsequent countries, um, we had a kind of like project onboarding um, to introduce them to the project as a whole, what their role was in creating content for that new site. Um, for this, for this project, we also did some domain strategy and SEO workshops. There's a lot of debate about how SEO fits exactly into content strategy. Um, but the domain strategy really kind of getting into how your URLs are structured and kind of a step back from that, how your content is kind of organized in that. Then we did a content migration plan, creation, and a module guide as before. So again, in our content strategy discovery, we identified and prioritized content requirements. And our previous learning from this was that content and design affect each other. So what changed this time, and by being involved earlier, at least so far in, we were involved at least in the design process, was that our findings from our audit were actually able to be considered in the visual design and development efforts. So as the stakeholders were reviewing comps, uh, we were able to feed them some of the content requirements and some of the content findings that we were seeing in the audit into those comp reviews. And so that then was able to affect how those pages were designed and what maybe would be able to wait until after launch into kind of like a, a post-launch sprint and what really needed to be created right now before launch. Uh, we were also able to make our URLs more, um, more SEO friendly. And then we had a content strategy design, setting up teams, processes, and tools. Our learning, learning from before is that we needed subject matter experts involved earlier on, and we were able to do that. Um, so in this case, the subject matter experts and writers actually had input in the IA and the design. Um, 
I remember for this particular site, there was a section called uh, homeowners, where it was a lot of content targeted at homeowners who uh, were maybe getting into purchasing a roof for the first time. And so it was a lot of kind of what to do, what to think about, what to look for when uh, making this roofing decision. And we had a t about like a two hour session where the subject matter experts and writers kind of hashed it out what this whole section of the site would look like organizationally as well as the structure on the site, which we were then able to um, involve the uh, designers in that conversation to then affect exactly what the design of that page would look like. And then another output of that was that the expectation of the kind of high level stakeholder was that we would make an information architecture for one country that could then be used by all of the other countries. Um, but the fact that we had this kind of two hour hash session uh, showed them that maybe this kind of rigid information architecture being reused by all the sites was a little bit too restrictive. And so then it allowed us to um, kind of set that expectation early on that this was going to be a flexible information architecture. Then all of the content was again created. Our previous learning being that uh, we wanted to provide feedback earlier on designs to create less of an image-driven site. And so with that in mind for this time, uh, when we were going to create the product page, uh, the designers had made this beautiful, very image-driven product page. Uh, and we were able to surface that the reality is that a lot of these products have really kind of like bad image quality images, small, like some of these products on this site are like, I don't know, like wood glue. And there just isn't going to be a great, you know, full width product image of wood glue. And so that kind of input earlier on uh, gave us, uh, informed the designers that there needed to be some kind of flexibility in how those product images were displayed on the site. And lastly, creating leave behind so that the site does not die with us. Um, our previous learning from that being getting input earlier on from development. So what changed this time is that we were talking with development early and often and that development constraints were planned for and not a surprise um, in how we set up uh, our tools for doing the content migration and for the content itself. And content requirements were also accounted for in development. This really came out in kind of the URL requirements um, for structuring those URLs. So the fact that we were able to talk to them earlier uh, and often meant that they didn't have to make a decision in a vacuum and that instead we could make a decision together. Yay, collaboration. So, um, some just tidbits of if uh, you're thinking about maybe involving a content strategist on your project or maybe looking more into content strategy yourself in the context of a content migration. If you hear things like, marketing will decide that later and marketing is not in the room and if this kind of keeps happening over and over where uh, no one is really taking responsibility for something on a site, um, this might be a case where either marketing should be in the room or content strategist should be in the room. Somebody who's advocating for what they know is uh, are the needs of content and the people who are creating content. You might need a content strategist if you see things like content on the existing site that just nobody talks about, where it's like, oh yeah, that solar section. Well, that solar section is actually 20 pages of like super dense content that somebody needs to rewrite or it's gonna, again, get no traffic and get, have nobody look at it. That should be a clear signal that uh, Somebody should look at it. Or lastly, if you are tempted by things like lorem ipsum. In some cases, this might be, you know, this might be what you have to do. Um, but I would challenge yourself and challenge your teams as much as possible to make it real as early as possible. And that's the thing. Thank you. <laughs> Um, after Q and A, I think. Okay. It's weird being recorded. Um, does anyone have any questions? 
Um, I think your hand was up first, maybe. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the role of analytics in either of these projects? Was there as part of the content audit, perhaps? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, analytics, our analytics team was not involved in either of these projects. Um, but I've been in other content migration projects where they have been involved, um, especially early on in that audit. Um, and they've been a really big help in figuring out, helping us to know kind of like what, like what pages are getting traffic um, and helping us to inform kind of then our priorities for um, in migration of like what should get our most attention right now in terms of like page creation or you know that kind of thing. So was there much of any content that was not brought over then? Uh, um, yeah. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I would say that in the first project, maybe 80% was brought over and 20% left behind. Um, and maybe like 60-40, 60% brought over in the roofing project and 40 left behind. It's amazing how much stuff piles up on sites. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm just curious, the decision, how, how is that reached in terms of what to leave behind or not bring it over? Them just say, yeah, we know it's no good, we don't want it to work. Yeah. Um, well, since they were not involved in this project, you know, a lot of a lot of that decisioning is some of it is straightforward. It's like, you know, a confirmation page of like, yay, you you bought a thing, like we don't need to make bring that over. We can recreate that in the context of the new workflow. Um, some of it is also, you know, like news or newsletters. It's kind of diminishing returns to bring over stuff from 2010 to your new website, um, especially if it's getting, you know, little traffic as is. Um, and some of it too just comes from the kind of new direction and new vision set forth by either the stakeholder or maybe the kind of digital consultant at the beginning of like, what does this new site and what does this new experience need to be and does this content fit or not fit into that? Or is it so poorly written and poorly structured that we might as well just kind of start over? Yeah, yeah. On larger sites, obviously you need to have some kind of a tool to do a mass import of the content. Uh, have you run into, what kind of limitations have you run into with those tools? Yeah, I mean, so, so my kind of like involvement in that is a little bit biased because I'm more involved in projects where we're not doing that so much. But the projects that I am involved with that do that are more kind of in, um, importing like product data. Um, I think the limitations that I see there, we definitely saw a limitation on the roofing company project where um, because we were bringing in different, a lot of different branded sites into one, all of them had different kind of metadata in place. Um, so. Again, I was like not super involved in that, but um, the kind of mismatch of metadata is, I know, a thing that our developers have to spend a lot of time on either correcting or end up doing manually because it's just um, can't be automated in any fast way. Yeah. How do you plan structuring the URLs and what's involved with that, especially if you're moving from an outside to a new, 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 new content? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think when you're when you're thinking about URL structure, you know, a lot of it is going to come down to how your content is organized on the site and come a lot from your information architecture. Um, but um, and the other kind of side of it too being like some SEO considerations with. Um, URLs are often looked at by search engines as having contextual clues for what's actually on the page. Um, and so that can inform kind of like literally what words you're using, but also how close they are to the domain itself. Um, I think a lot of times too where I see domain strategy stuff come into question is really like, you know, should you go domain, should you go subdomain, should you go subfolder for your site? So thinking about like, where your blog should be on your site, if it should be its own site, if it should be a microsite, um, and also language considerations too. Um, I tend to work with a lot of sites and a lot of companies that have like tons and tons of languages. Um, and so thinking through kind of questions of like how much content is translated, 
like how well is it translated? Is it just automated? And also how localized is that content and how truly targeted is it towards a specific country or language also kind of feeds into um, how that's accounted for in a URL. So a lot of questions that goes into <laughs> URL structuring. Yeah. So we just got the new content strategy leadership and we're kind of taking a step back and looking at everything that we're doing, all our best practices. And you had mentioned a couple times that writing for web best practices, do you have a recommendation of where we can find resources for that? Um, that's a great question. Uh, I do not off the top of my head. Um, we When we create it, we just kind of create it from scratch a lot, but um, yeah, I'll do some Googling, and if I get your info and I find anything, I can definitely send it your way. Is there a top five rules of writing content for the web that you can... Sorry, what? Is there like a top five rules that you think of for writing content for the web? Oof, boy, quiz time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say... Uh, Keep it simple, um, short, short sentence structure. Um, you know, easy, easily digestible words um, is definitely a good thing to have because, um, kind of in our day and age, people don't like reading very much, um, and so having simple, quickly digestible kind of sentences and words on a page is really important. Um, and also, if you have a lot of content on your page, um, have it putting it into bullets. I think is an often overlooked um, tool that people can use to just make also content more digestible at a glance. That's two. Um, <laughs> um, those will get you pretty far. Oh, and also the inverted triangle. So like starting with your most important thing and then kind of ending with a little bit of like what's less important, especially for those pages that have more content on them because uh, people tend to start reading and then stop before they get to the end of a page or end of a uh, section. I've got three. Yeah. <laughs> Actually related to this, in terms of creating a form, yeah. um, keeping it simple, but if they're need to explain some of the concepts or some of the questions, do you include it on the form or do you think it's best just to have a page with instructions so they yeah. Um, I'm always an advocate for like in in page or contextual help because um, forcing somebody to go to a new page or another area to get help um, is a faster way to lose them. Um, but I think that's definitely an opportunity area where you can work with like visual designer, UX designer, UI person um, to figure out a way to possibly like hide that information until it's necessary with maybe like a hover over type functionality. Um, or possibly styling it in a different way than the other kind of form content of the page so that it's there but like not there with everything else. Yeah? Um, can you speak about the working relationship between say the content strategist and the UX designer on these type of projects? It, it sounds like <laughs> the like we work together. Kind of overlap. <laughs> so, in, at least from what I see and I'm just trying to understand I guess the lines of I don't know, collaboration or... Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's, I think it's really different at every company. Um, at, I think at our company, though, because we are an enterprise, we work with a lot of enterprise level folks that oftentimes we're focusing on like super large sites. And you can also jump in if you totally disagree. But um, I think... I think in that context, um, sometimes user experience designers are more are are more focused maybe at a slightly higher level than maybe a content strategist would look at, and so that we're we're kind of really dive, diving deep on like words, information, structure on a page, um, and process as well. Um, whereas maybe user experience designers are less interested in that. I don't know. Feel free to yeah. jump in. No, um, yeah, so we do work together. Um, so I think. Part of the, uh, and I'm on the UX side, so I think part of it also is the maturity of the industry. Um, I don't know if this is specific to our organization. I think it probably is more industry-wide. UX 
has gotten a little bit more of a toehold recently, but I think a big part of what we do as UX practitioners is we understand the offering of the content strategy folks and we evangelize to bring them in. So the second I hear something that sent a sense of content, like Danny pointed out there, I immediately sort of you know raise that flag and try to grab one of the people from, from her team and bring them in on the conversation. So it's as much the awareness of I can do content conversations, I cannot do the content migration and sort of the larger structure of things. But I know taxonomy, I know information architecture, but there's a there's a level of complexity that we don't handle. Um, we just aren't living it as as much. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was just curious, uh, you mentioned about the collaboration with the engineers and the other teams. Uh, could you talk about some of the tools that you've used uh, specific for the content team and some of the tools you've used uh, that have helped that you know, uh, you know, cross discipline collaboration. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'll speak more about the roofing company example. Um, we use a tool. We use a tool called Gather Content, um, which is a basically like a content management tool that's helpful in migrations like this, um, where uh, it. It tracks things like workflow. It tracks things like uh, like what content you're working on um, and where it is in its process. And it can be kind of modified to reflect wireframes in a lot of ways. Um, and that is a nice kind of repository for content that a developer can go in um, and see what's finished and see what's not finished and see how it should be mapping to maybe the wireframes or comps that they already have in hand um, to then um, kind of plug in that content. Uh, I will say with Gather Content, they make it sound like it's a quick and easy API into Sitecore or whatever, and it's not. <laughs> so that is another opportunity area, I would say, even with, with this project, where um, starting that conversation earlier on and setting up your, you know, setting up the developers for success and giving them enough time to either set up that API or know that they're going to still be manually pulling it out of gather content um, is a good conversation to have super early on. Um, I've also been on other projects where Jira has been has been helpful, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jira can get very complicated very quickly, uh, but it is another option for just kind of task tracking and all that. Um, but I would say like two kind of Fundamentally, for develop for collaborating with any team is just sharing, sharing your deliverables and sharing your work earlier and often, and working very hard to kind of meet them where they are. So um, I I failed time and time again as a content strategist to kind of just say, here's the stuff, come get it, and that can sometimes work. But what's more helpful is trying really hard to say like, this is what I think is going to be helpful for you, and where I think you should be plugging it into your work. What do you think? Um, and that has kind of helped sculpt the conversation in a bit more of a productive way so that, you know, three months later when it's like, wait, I showed you that thing, didn't you, like, integrate it? And the answer is no. Um, we can try to prevent that from happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Are you involved with, like, the scoping of this, these projects? Like, I'm starting to get involved with scoping in our work and I'm... Yeah not necessarily, I can base it off like smaller sites and stuff, but like trying to figure out like how long an audit and an inventory and map are, is going to take, then comparing it to like how long it actually took and yeah. uh, the problems with like budgets and like do you like move through even if you like find there's a lot more than what you like budgeted you would spend time on or do you just say, sorry, we're stopping here? Yeah. Um, great question. It sounds like sounds like two questions. One is like yeah, prediction, and one is like when you're in it. Um, for for scoping, our our team collectively has spent a lot of time in kind of tracking what our, how long projects are taking, so that we can hone in more and more on factors that affect the, the time a project will take. So like number of pages, complexity of pages. Is there translation involved? Is there a third party involved? Is there um, you know, are there a lot of subject matter experts involved? So tracking those kinds of factors that you start to observe are contributing to how long things take. Um, and then in terms of being in a project, 
and discovering that there's maybe more or another area that you need to kind of suddenly have to work on. It depends. I think it depends on like how, it depends. Um, I, I've been on projects where we've just kind of done, done it, if it's been like not too involved or if we save time in another area to just do like a quick win of like, hey, we found this thing, it's not in scope, but we can do it for you, you know, really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a great way to kind of gain yeah. clients' favor. Um, but, or if it's like a really big thing, then like change order can't be, change order or prioritize. Mm -hmm. um, is this more important than this other thing? Um, and getting the clients kind of input in that. Assumptions are your friends though. <laughs> Exclusions. Exclusions and assumptions, yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks all again for coming. Um, there's my LinkedIn if you want to stay in touch or if you want to stay in touch in a more direct way, feel free to chat with me. And otherwise, best, in luck, best of luck with all of your content endeavors. <laughs>